Wonderful. Well, I'm just so excited about this next presentation because I've heard him before and I've never really cared that much about cybersecurity until he started talking about it. So um, our next presentation is cybersecurity update. And our instructor is Mr. Les Nettleton, who served as Bourgeois Bennett's Director of Information Technology Services for 35 years. In that capacity, he managed the team of specialists that both supports the technological infrastructure of Bourgeois Bennett and provided individualized technology services to the firm's diverse client base. Les has specialized experience in the areas of systems analysis, technology management consulting, database management, and information systems training. He regularly addresses academic community and professional groups and organizations, both locally and nationally, on a variety of technology topics and provides technology training to the firm's staff. Les was awarded the 2020 Outstanding CPE Discussion Leader by the Louisiana State Society of CPAs after receiving the highest overall speaking rating of 2022. Welcome, Mr. Les Nettleton. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just make sure y'all can hear me. Can y'all hear me in the back? If you can't hear me, raise your hand. You people online, can you hear me? Great. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. I love this auditorium. I love this whole thing. A uh, couple of important things. Number one, if you'll notice on the bottom of my slide, there's a very important word there, retired. May was quite an event for me because in May, I was able to retire from my job after 37 years of being with Bourgeois Bennett. It's been unbelievable. Also in May, my old, thank you, my oldest son informed my wife and I that we would be grandparents for the first time. And my youngest son informed us that he's going to get married. So it's, it's kind of like May was just a great, absolutely great year. The one problem is, is that I had the, whoops, let's make sure this thing works. There we go. I had the opportunity to start sitting at home and start looking at what I had been doing for my cybersecurity talks. And one of the things about cybersecurity is that I was always focused on how to prevent it. What can you do to stop it? Well, you can increase your firewall, you can make your firewall a little bit better, you can do virus scanning software, uh, password keeping managers. Uh, there's just an awful lot to, uh, would I be better turn this off? There we go, a little bit better. Um, so I had been approaching cybersecurity more from the really high tech level. And all of a sudden I sat at home for May and June and started reading up about cybersecurity. And what I found out was it's a humanistic issue. You cannot throw a technological solution toward a humanistic issue. So that's what we're gonna talk about today is we're gonna get into this whole thing of uh, humanistic sides of how to prevent being hacked and getting into. Okay, so first of all, let's go back to what happened a few years back. Capital One. How many Capital One people here? Anybody got Cap One? Yeah, I do too. I'm a Cap One person. Let me do this. Let me move this mic right there so it's getting a little bit better so it's not fading back when I'm going back and forth. All right, so what happened? Cap One got hacked. All right, if you're a Cap One person, your information got hacked. So, 100 million customer accounts got hacked, 140,000 social security numbers, 1 million Canadian social security numbers, 80,000 bank accounts, and an undisclosed number of names, addresses, credit scores, credit limits, and balances. That's back in 2019, it's four years ago. We should have been scared to death if we had a Cap One account because this got hacked. We'll talk about why in a second. Equifax, who remembers Equifax being breached? Okay, this was one of the great ones because they're the ones protecting our credit report. And if they're getting hacked, what's, you know, what, what can we do? So 143 million people, 143 million got hacked. They got their names, addresses, and social security numbers, 200,000 credit card numbers, 10.9 million driver's license numbers. And what can they do with that information? Well, they can do a lot of things. They can also file false tax returns because they have all the information they need on you in your name, address, and social security number. So let's move forward to this year. What happened in Louisiana? The Department of Motor Vehicles got hacked. Okay, now, actually the Department of Motor Vehicles did not get hacked. Okay, what happened was the, the company called Move It, which is the company that they use to be able to bring the information in and out, it got hacked. Okay. Um, the global hack of Move It exposed six 
million Louisiana driver's license information. If you have a driver's license here, okay, your information is out there right now on the dark web. What did they get? They got your name, address, social security number, birth date, height, eye color, driver's license number, vehicle registration, and handicap place card information. They have that information on every single one of you guys. And if that doesn't scare you to death, I don't know what will. You need, we need as a group to start becoming very concerned and make security on our side. Because of these hacks happening, that people have our information, we need to make sure that we are doing our diligence and due diligence to make sure that these are not, get, that we are looking at these and looking at emails and looking at text messages we're getting and looking at our accounts and making sure our accounts are not being hacked into using our information. So what did the Department of Motor Vehicles say you should do? Now, each one of these, my wife and I did within the first 10 minutes of learning about the Department of Motor Vehicles hack. The first thing they said is that you should freeze your credit reports. So you have a copy of the slides here. You can either call the phone numbers or go use that, uh, use that URL and go on to each of the three credit agencies and freeze your credit report. What freezing your credit report does is that if anybody tries to establish credit using your name, the credit agency is not going to go ahead and give them the, okay, here's the information. They're going to say, no, it's frozen. Yes, you will if you need to go out and get credit. You will have to unfreeze your credit report. But trust me, this is something we did. It took us about 10 to 15 minutes total on all three accounts. Every single person in this room and every single person online should have done this by now. If you haven't, do it as soon as possible. Go ahead and freeze your credit reports. All right, so once you do, because I had gone ahead and given this out at another presentation I gave, and somebody said, wait a second, I froze my credit reports, and I started getting emails from unrequested emails, spam emails, from these agencies. It was from the agencies they were getting them, but because you had done this, they started to send emails. You will get emails. Delete them. There's a delete key on your computer. Simply hit the delete key, or say send it to spam. Uh, some people say, oh, I didn't, I didn't want to go ahead and do that because I knew I was going to get emails. So you're not going to protect your credit because you might have to delete an email. I, I don't get the sense of that. Again, we need to put our minds into a totally different place than where they are now when it comes to security. And then you have to, you can the thing goes to your spam folder, you clear your spam folder out. All right. When I worked for Bourgeois Bennett, we would have a number of people each year that when we went to file their tax return, the IRS would tell us, that person has already filed their tax return. They hadn't. What it was, was your information is out there from the standpoint of the Department of Motor Vehicles and the Equifax and these other breaches. They had the information that they're able to file tax returns on your behalf. Trust me, they're filing tax returns on your behalf. They're not paying money, though. I guarantee the refunds are a lot more than a refund you would have gotten on yours. So, what we would do is, when we would have that happen, we would request to the IRS to give that taxpayer a PIN number, totally separate PIN number. And they would then require that PIN number on all correspondence and all tax forms. You look at your top of your 1040, your 1040 has that information to say to put the PIN number in it. We proactively, my wife and I proactively, went out and got PIN numbers for ourselves so nobody can go ahead and do this. If you're filing a joint return, you must, each of you must get a PIN number. You can't just get one PIN number and go ahead and do this. Now, let me stop right here. What I'm telling you today is both from your business sense and your personal sense. What I want you to do with this information is I want you to take all this information that I'm going to give you, bring it back to your businesses, bring it back to your organizations, bring it back to your companies, go bring it back to your agencies, and then share it with your friends, share it with your family, share it with the person next door to you. The only way we're going to get out of this is if we start to educate ourselves on how to fight cybersecurity. So this is one of the things that we did proactively. Every single person can do it. It protects your tax return from being fraudulently filed by somebody. Also, they said, check your Social Security benefits. Okay, I retired. I went on to Social Security. I applied for Social Security. Wound up that now I will go out and check each week to make sure that nobody has gotten into my Social Security account. It's just another thing that I have to do. There's no warning that can come on the front end. I need to make sure that if my Social Security account gets hacked or someone is having checks sent to another, uh, another address, that I'm able to know about that at some point in time. And that information on Social Security and the phone number is at the bottom of this slide. 
The final thing that the um, Department of Motor Vehicles said was to change your passwords. Now this one bothers me a little bit because I am never going to say don't change your passwords. Okay, you should be changing your passwords often. I'm not going to say how often, but often. Okay, maybe at somewhere between a month, three months, but it needs to be changed every now and then. Now I, I understand. I got a spreadsheet right now with about 200 passwords on it. Yes, I take a Friday afternoon or a Saturday evening and I sit down with a couple of glasses of wine and I start to change my passwords. Administration of your personal information takes time and we're all too busy to do this, but we got to change that mindset. We have to move on from, oh, I really don't feel like doing that. And what we're going to talk about in the way of passwords later on is you should never use the same two passwords in ever, any two entities. That's coming up. But the Department of Motor Vehicles, what got hacked from them, I'm not sure that changing your password is a necessity due to that. There's nothing that really got they get that taken that they could figure out your password on that. But again, I don't want to say, if the Department, Department of Motor Vehicles said you should change your password, change your passwords. Go ahead and do it. It's a, it's a good impetus for that. So if you were to get hacked, you have a data breach into your systems. And this works also at home. We're going to talk about some home systems too. First, move quickly to secure your systems and fix the vulnerabilities which caused the breach. It could be hardware, it could be software, but probably it's going to be a user that did that. I'm going to show you a shocking statistic in just a few minutes. Mobilize your breach response team. If you don't have a breach response team right now, then you are behind the curve. You need to start looking proactively as what happens when we get hacked, not what happens if we get hacked. Because trust me, over the next five to six years, you're all going to get hacked at some point in time. Probably most of y'all will never know that you got hacked. You'll never know it because they're going to sit there in the background and they're just going to run things on your system and gather your information. But you need to, be, you need to have a response team in place right now as to what you're going to do. Consult with your legal counsel, take all affected equipment offline, and fix your vulnerabilities. Now, this one has changed a little bit. People are paying ransom with ransomware. Remember, ransomware is nothing more than somebody gets access to your system, they take the files in your system, and they encrypt them. They turn them into something else that you can't use them. They're unusable. And then they contact you and say, okay, uh, we'll give you the key to get your systems back. Pay us X amount of money. Okay, That's ransomware. Now, some people have very successfully paid the, the ransom and gotten their information back. Okay. The ransoms are not cheap, by the way. We have found in New Orleans, we had one of our clients that got hacked, uh, asked for ransomware for, I think they were asking somewhere around $500,000 to get the information back. And that's on the cheap end, by the way. Um, we were able to find a person for $10,000, and that person was able to go ahead and get the key and, um, and get rid of the uh, ransomware. But now it winds up to where the FBI has gotten involved, the Treasury Department has gotten involved, and it may be illegal to go ahead and pay a ransom now. They don't want you to do this anymore. So you need to contact your people, especially your attorney, and contact your cyber insurance carrier. They're the ones. A 2023 report on ransomware trends found that 19% of organizations that pay a ransom couldn't recover the data anyway. Now, I'm not going to say that you shouldn't do this, but if 19% didn't recover the data, 81% did. So I'm looking at that as a positive. If I pay the ransom, I'm able to get my information back. However, if, they, if you pay the ransom and they give you your decryption key, you have to have that decryption key vetted. Because what the bad guys will do is they'll send you the key and all your files come back. But inside of that key is a little clock. It's like a time bomb and it's ticking. And it'll wait three months, six months, and all of a sudden it's going to go ahead and boop, I'm going to do it one more time. So you get, the, you get the ransom, you pay the ransom, you clean all your systems up, you secure your systems on down, and because of something you did by just going ahead and taking the key and putting the key inside of, the, um, of your system, you wound up in, uh, ruining your system another time. Here's the stats. 95% of cybersecurity breaches result from human error. Human error. It ain't the, uh, it ain't the um, firewall. It ain't the virus scanning software, it's us. We're the cause of this whole thing. 
Okay, now, that 95% could be the human error, could be that I set up my server incorrectly, or my firewall is set up incorrectly, or I'm, my virus scanning software is out of date and not updating itself. That could be what the 95% is. You wanna get really shocked? 99% of email attacks rely on a victim clicking on a link. We can end this session right now. Don't click on any links in emails. Don't ever click a link in email. Don't click links in emails. You don't have to. There are other ways to do this, other ways to get by. But you see, the problem is, is that now they're using psychology. My minor's in psychology, so I like the concept of what are they psychologically doing to try to make you click things. My Discover card's been hacked three times. If I get an email from Discover, not really, but it looks like it's from Discover, and it says my account's been hacked, my hand goes to the mouse and I'm gonna, you know, it says click here to go ahead and access your account. I will go ahead and move my hand to the mouse and, ah, oh, no, don't click here. What should I do? Call them or go to their website and log on. You can tell what's going on. I'm gonna I, hopefully I'm gonna have enough time at the end to tell you a really scary story about what people are doing to be able to get a hold of your money. Anyway, 99% of all emails attacks rely on a victim clicking on a link. What should we not do? Don't click on links. Kevin Epstein, Vice President of Proofpoint, their security awareness site. Organizations need a holistic, people-centric cybersecurity approach that includes effective security awareness training. The only way we're gonna get out of this whole thing right now is we have to train our people. I'm training you. You've got to go now and train other people too. You've got to keep continually training. I'm gonna show you in a few minutes a bunch of different scams that are going on right now, and the new ones just keep coming out, and they, you, you need to stay updated on what's going on. 45% of companies indicate that their personnel have a problematic shortage of cybersecurity skills. 45%, that's amazing to me. I didn't recognize that when I was in the business world, now I'm sitting in the secular world, and like 45% that don't have, they have a problematic shortage of cybersecurity skills? No, everybody that uses a computer should be up to date on cybersecurity skills. When you went and got a driver's license and started to drive, did they just go, here you go? No. Now you do that when you become a parent and you try to figure out what you're supposed to be doing with your kids, but your driver's license, you gotta take tests, you gotta go ahead and do all kinds of stuff. You gotta know what you're doing before you get behind the wheel of a car. Well, all of your financial information or most of your financial information is accessed via your computer. Are you putting forward the same effort that you do to get a driver's license, the same um, training that you're doing to get your driver's license in when you use a computer? And most of the people are not. Most data breaches are based upon exploiting common user knowledge gaps to social engineering to install malware or to give away their credentials. They're trying to trick you and they're very, very good at it. Hold that thought for a few seconds. Now, I hate reading the slides, but I'm just gonna have to read this one. The key to establishing a strong culture of cybersecurity is ensuring that employees understand the importance of executing their daily tasks and activities while being cognizant of security. Now, I'm not gonna ask for a show of hands. This means everything that you're doing on a computer, the first thing that's going in and out of your mind, security. Got a spreadsheet to pull up? Let me think about security. Can I pull up securely? Can I do what? Security might be number one. This may be simple enough, but creating such a culture, and this is our issue, creating such a culture involves transformation from top to bottom. The way employees work, the way leaders lead, and the way processes are executed, and the way issues are addressed. Therefore, if you are a boss, it is incumbent upon you to get your employees to be on board with this type of information, to be on board with, I want to make sure that I know every single thing that I do on a computer basically has some sort of repercussion to it or a possible repercussion. So let's look at what we can do to identify emails and scams and things like that. All right, so first of all, the way you can recognize something on here. This is an email from Emeritus. They're saying we're gonna give away 500 flights to celebrate our anniversary. Um, notice the circled HTTP, okay? First of all, if you go to any website and you see HTTP instead of HTTPS, 
get off the website immediately. The S means that it's a secured website. The HTTP means it's an unsecured website. Therefore, immediately if I went ahead and I said, you know what, I want a free flight, I'm going to click on this link, I am going to an unsecured site to click on a link to begin with. But number two part of this, look at the dash in the name. Okay, and this may be more easily seen up at the top where it says www.emeritus.com. You know how we have .com, .net, .biz, .all these other things? They're always something, .something. That shows what it's going to go to. What's the dot on this address? Club. It's .club. This isn't a .com or a .net. It's tricking you to think that it's a .com. But it's not because after the comma is an, an uh, apostrophe, I mean, apostrophe. <laughs> wow, Ret what retirement does to you. The hyphen is in between com and free tickets. Therefore, this site that it's going to go to is emeritus.com uh, hyphen free tickets. And the dot club can almost immediately tell you this is not going to a good website. But you have to look at these things. You can't just click on things. One of the most dangerous things, by the way, going on right now, go online right now and search for a manual for some appliance you have in your house. Okay, And you go online, and the first thing that Google or whoever you use will show is a listing of all these different places that have manuals. Look at the right hand, left-hand side of them. You'll see some say add. If it says add, don't click on it. You pay money, they pay money to Google to move themselves up to the top. The problem is, the bad guys are paying money to Google to move themselves up to the top. And so if you click on it, what happens, and I'm going to show you this in a second, how we get to it, there's a possibility of you being exposed to a virus. All right, a couple of things on this email. This is from Intuit, okay? Notice, though, at the top where it says the from address, is lotusq260 at realliving.com. That doesn't look like Intuit to me. So the first thing you can do whenever you get any email, you want to look inside, not at your subject matter when you're looking at the listing of all your emails. Open the email and then look at who has sent the email and make sure that that name matches the name that's in front or matches who it should be coming from. Here they put a fake bank account. They use threats by saying, we will withdraw from your bank account 1500 bucks. Now here's the secret. This is what I, one of the things I really want you to take back to your people. If you hover your mouse over a link, don't click on a link. Simply hover your mouse over a link. What will happen is a box will pop up, and that's that yellow box you see there, and it will tell you where you're going to go if you go ahead and click on the link, where it's going to bring you. Therefore, even though this link says here, the hovering says it's going to go to some place called Comica, HSPP, uh, .net. And then once you get to the slash, by the way, that's anything after that is okay. But it's not going to Intuit. It's going to some place totally different. And what else is on here? It's HTTP. It's not a secured site. So, but again, please don't click on them. Hover your mouse over them. And you'd be surprised when you get these scam emails, the number of ones that don't actually go back to where you want it to go before. All right, who watches Netflix? Yeah, you got to have your Netflix. Oh my goodness, what happens? All of a sudden I get an email, my Netflix account has been, we're having trouble with my billing, my Netflix. No, no, I can't miss my shows. You know, this is too important. So what do I do? I click here to update my account information now. No, again, don't click on anything, links or anything inside of emails. Just go to your Netflix account, log into Netflix, and go to your account and see if your account has actually been suspended or hacked. Odds are you're going to find out that this is fake. It hasn't actually been suspended or hacked. Same thing with your Apple ID being locked. Click here to update your Apple ID. No. Go on to apple.com or icloud.com or one of these other ones. Go to your phone. Log into your Apple account and see if it has actually been locked. You'll probably find out that it hasn't been locked, but don't let these things trick you. Again, now we're into psychology. They're going to take places like Netflix and Apple, things that people use all the time that you really can't do without, and try to make you panic that you need to go ahead and do something more. PayPal. I love PayPal. I use it all the time. I think PayPal is fantastic. Well, here's a PayPal that's saying response is required, and there's a nice little halfway down, a nice little link to say log into my account. 
and go to the Resolution Center. Well, hey, I don't have to click Log In. I can simply click Resolution Center and go right there. No, again, go to your PayPal account and open up the PayPal account and see if it actually has anything in there. So we talked about you're out surfing for something on the net and you come to, like I said, manuals, and you take your manuals and you click on the first one that has ad in front of it, which you should never do, but you click on the first one, manuals.com or whatever. And all of a sudden, this screen pops up on your computer. Okay, now, what, first thing I know is that when this screen pops up on your computer, you've gone to some hacked site. The website that you've went to is hacked. Okay, you didn't do anything wrong, you're not surfing porn, you're not out doing anything else, you are simply went to a bad website. Okay, but what is it telling you? You got a virus. Well, you may have a virus. We're not really sure, but what you do, call that phone number immediately. I can't tell you in the past five months the number of phone calls I've gotten from people that I know that said, Les, I, I, I call that phone number and, and they got me into this back and forth. I'm like, no, don't do this. Here's what you do. If you get, and by the way, these things that come on your screen, they will come also with a, fla a flashing screen and a nice loud sound, like a siren or something like that, to make you go into total panic mode and try to find like your credit card details, stuff like that. Here's the problem. You don't want to click this window at all. Clicking anywhere in this window is going to execute the virus that's trying to get on your computer. What you want to do, take your laptop, and you're going to hold the on-off button down for 10 seconds, and you're going to crash your computer and then bring your computer back up. And we have had 100% success with this virus going away. It does not infect your computer unless you go ahead and click inside of here, okay? So you're gonna hold your on-off button down for 10 seconds, crash your computer, pull it back up. I had somebody a few weeks ago, Les, I, if I do that, I'm gonna lose all my work. Yes, you're gonna lose all your work. That's why every five to 10 minutes you click File Save and make sure that you're saving your files, that you're not just going ahead and putting this out here. So yes, you're gonna lose your work, but it's better than losing your computer. Okay, just make sure that you're going ahead and, and hold the on-off button on that. Here's another one, exact same thing. This one hit the Mac. Okay, your computer may be infected. Uh, here's a phone number, blah, 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 blah. Uh, same thing, simply hold the on-off button down and go. Um, obviously, if you are hitting bad websites that you shouldn't be going to, this will happen more often. But don't think that just because this happens to you that you are doing something incorrect, you're doing something wrong. Okay? Now, my favorite, Microsoft. Microsoft does not issue virus warnings. You're not going to get an email or, or a call from Microsoft saying, hey, you're giving out a virus. They don't care. They're not worried about viruses on your computer. They will not call you. It's a fake. They won't call about infected computers, and they won't give away money to people who forward email messages. At least once a month, I get an email from somebody saying, forward this to 100 people, and we will give you a dollar for each person that you send this to. How do they know? They don't know that. They're not tracking that. They can't track where the emails are going when I'm forwarding their email. So, Basically, you have to make sure that you know I'm not going to go ahead and I'm not going to give in to this scam. Microsoft might call you if you're a TechNet member, that's one of the technique portions of it, or if you're a journalist. Other than that, you're not going to get a call from Microsoft. Ignore it. If you get the message, don't do anything with it. Now, this is an interesting one because here it is. Microsoft here, have you gotten this, this same exact thing? You all of a sudden you're surfing the, surfing the net and this pops up on your screen and it's asking you for your username and password. Holy cow. Okay, I've just gotten into something now that says, I want your username and password for your Microsoft Edge, which is usually your Microsoft account and Microsoft password. What do you think is gonna happen if you give somebody your username and password for your Microsoft account? They're gonna use your Microsoft account to go infect other people. Don't ever fill in this information. If you have some sort of question or some sort of problem on it, go online and start to do a little bit of research on it. Now, this is one that's really kind of bothering me, especially when I was working for Bourgeois Bennett. Being a full service CPA firm, we had a lot of confidentiality issues. Not issues, but things we had to consider from a confidentiality standpoint. 
One of the things was making sure we had people's information, especially their tax information, secured. Okay, we don't want to do a file transfer with anybody that's not using a secure file transfer portal. So, I got this email from Joseph Bayer. Now, notice at the top, Joseph Bayer matches the from Joseph Bayer. Hmm, check number one. That works out. Could be legit. My name's Joseph Bayer. I was recommending your service, blah, 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 blah. The other yellow part. I have included my son's social security card and driver's license in the mail attachment. So there's an attachment to this email. And the guy's telling me he's going to put his son's social security number, hmm, and his driver's license number, hmm, in the attachment. Okay. Should I open up this attachment? No. Now, here's the problem. Bourgeois Bennett gives 10% new business bonus if we bring on a new client. I want to open up this attachment. I want this person to be brought on board. But you know what? I had to read this secondarily and say, I was recommended your service by a coworker, and I need help in completing my 2022 taxes. I'm not the, a tax person. I'm the IT guy. Why would, they be, why would some, one of his coworkers recommend me rather than one of my tax people to go ahead and do this? So obviously this is fake, okay? And because it came with an attachment, it's even higher level from the standpoint of, in my mind, what, how I'm gonna handle this. But this is going to the one that's gonna get people. And this is happening, by the way, with text messages too. So you really need to be careful of how you handle these. Now here's Ken, Ken sent me a, uh, sent Linda, who's one of our tax people, an email. I'm in need of your services, my marriage status, blah, blah, blah. I can send you my documents in last year's return for you to go over it. Let me know your prices and charges. And there's no attachment on here. So this is a safe email. I can't get in any trouble with this email, right? One problem, reply to it. Because what have you done? Yes, I would love to do your taxes. Uh, we charge blah, 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 blah. Back. Okay, fantastic. What do you need me to send you? for you to look at my taxes in the past. Well, I need you to send me your 2022 return. And guess what we just did? We just invited the boogeyman in. Because this person doesn't exist, they're just simply getting us into a back and forth conversation until we feel comfortable, like an old friend. Hey, we can go ahead and open up anything from this guy sends us because I know it's not an unknown source. It's a known source. No, it's not. It's not a known source. Same thing here. Now, one, this is the exact same one, it's the same type, but I want you to look up at the from. Notice the cshow.jp. Anybody know what JP stands for? That's Japan. This is an email coming from Japan. So I'm not sure that the people in Japan want Bourgeois Bennett and New Orleans doing their tax returns, but from that standpoint, it's probably going to be fake to begin with. And again, what is the typical fee that you would charge to try to get us into a back and forth conversation? Same thing with an extension of the return. Notice here it's an IO, that's the uh, Indian organization, British, Indian, British Indies organization. Um, but notice the high here. It says hi less n at bb-cp.com. Not my name, it has my email address. That's because they're using a program to send it and then they plug that into the same thing into the email. All right, this is a good one from Amazon. Now, I purchase daily off of Amazon. And notice it went to 10 different people. Now, it might be hard to read, but do you notice what the name is? It's Les Pendergrass, because Teddy is my brother. Okay, I, I'm, I'm still trying to figure this one out. But I wanted to point out here, besides this being fake, how I could tell it's fake, and I had to do this as a screenshot from my phone to be able to show you this. You notice anything? Similar on every, the 10 email addresses they went to? They're all Bell South. Oh, wait, they had 10 accounts from Amazon that got canceled, and remarkably, every single one of them was a Bell South account. Oh, wow, what a coincidence. No, this is all fake, all fake. All right, this is a text message that came in from Regions Bank. I don't do anything with Regions Bank. I'm not a Regions Bank person, but you get a text message and says, please follow this link, and you click on the link, and it puts something on your phone, okay? These are the things you have to be cognizant of. Same thing here from Venmo, all right? Please use the below to recover your account. No, go out to Venmo.com and get past here. 
New, a new detail, somebody's using my device, because if you're Netflix now, Netflix is cracking down on you sharing your password, you're using the password. So here it's saying it's somebody in Texas, United States, this location may not be exact, which leads me into one of my jokes on, on the side where, okay, well, if we're not exact, we say Texas, where would we be? Oklahoma, Louisiana, exact is a relative term. Same thing with PayPal, Your account has been restricted. And this is my favorite. Now, this is a text message I got. And it's saying, hey, Les, would you return my text when you get a chance? I have a favor to ask Reverend Timothy Hendrick. And this is Father Tim, pastor of my church. I'm on a pastoral council. So I don't reply to this, but what I do a while later is I get an email from Father Tim telling me that somebody has spoofed his text account and is sending out text messages to all the people that have their phone numbers listed in the parish bulletin. And the favor they're going to ask is that you go over to Walgreens or CVS and buy $1,000 worth of gift cards, iTunes gift cards, and then call him up and scratch off the back of the gift card and give him the number. And at that point in time, that gift card becomes just as good as cash. Now, the worst part is, in my parish, when this went out, this went out to about 25 different people, we had seven people out of 25 that went to CVS and did this. I, 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 and and I'm, I'm, I'm shaking my head. I'm like, what's going on? Well, the problem is nobody trained them. Nobody took the time to tell them, don't do this. If you have any time, an email or a text message or anything else that has some sort of financial transaction on it, have a second set of eyes look at it before you do anything. Always get that second set of eyes. My wife hates it because I go ahead, dare, come take a look at this real quick. And she goes, ahead, no, that's fake. Okay, good. So I shouldn't, I shouldn't send Father Tim $10,000 in iTunes cards, right? Yeah, it, it would be a good idea. Uh, here's one on um, uh, QuickBooks, by the way. If you look here, my QuickBooks subscription has, needs to be renewed. But look at the address if I hover over the link what it goes to. It goes to quick.books into it. It's not going to QuickBooks. This is a fake email address, again, trying to get you to click on something. Office 365. How many people are using Office 365 here in the house? Okay, good number. We moved to Office 365 a couple of years ago and love it. Absolutely love it. Great because it automatically updates and everything else. One of the issues we had, though, was messages that were coming across like this to our staff. Our staff was getting messages saying, hey, you need to change your password. So we made the executive decision that we were going to go ahead and make our, we could, we could force a password change every X number of days on our Microsoft accounts. We weren't doing that anymore. We're going to say, no, your password never expires. You can go ahead and keep your password. And that's the only one that we do that with is the Microsoft account because we don't want to have people tricked into giving up their Microsoft account name and, and username. Flipping off of that and changing subjects just a little bit. So how do we stop this thing? Well, first of all, training, training, training. And I can't say that enough. You've got to have somebody in-house who knows something about cybersecurity or is keeping up to date with the latest scams, who is at least once every three to six months getting in front of your entire organization and telling them about what's out there right now and keeping them informed. And if you're not doing that, you're just not doing what you should be doing to keep your information and your clients' information safe. I had made a prediction about five years ago that username passwords by this time would have expired. They'd be gone. We wouldn't be using username passwords anymore. We'd be using two-factor authentication. We'd be using some sort of biometrics to be able to get into our stuff. It was not going to be a... Um, a username password because people just don't change their passwords. So two-factor authentication, basically it's like when you, it's something you have, something you know, and something you are. And you need two of those things. Uh, if you have an Amazon account, a Discover account, you can turn these on. Guess what I did? I turned it on. Yes, it now makes me, when I go to log into my Amazon account, it now makes me go out and get a code and come back and put in a code. Oh, Les, that's so inconvenient. Yes, security is inconvenient. There's no way of making it any way. There's, I can't make, give you the silver bullet. I can't make it any easier. Security is inconvenient. You are going to be inconvenienced by having to do security type stuff. So, 
if you have the capability of turning this on, by the way, you can also do this with Facebook. If someone goes in and tries to do something, they will send you a, an authorization because people's Facebook accounts are getting hacked. By the way, I'm, I'm a Facebook user. How many people here use Facebook? Okay, if you get an instant messenger from Facebook, okay, and it's a video, ignore it. That's how people are getting, you see, on my email account, my Facebook account's been hacked. That's because somebody clicked on a video inside of, their, inside of the message inside of Facebook. But the two-factor authentication is the way to go. If you can turn it on, turn it on. Passwords, so we're gonna talk about this. You need to use a different password for every single entity, okay? So, basically, the problem is, is that your username and password combination Usually, your username is your email address, okay? So you can't change that. What can you change? You can change your password, all right? Now, here's what I do, because I think that going through, all I want is a different password for each different entity that I'm putting down. And I want to make it easy on myself, because my memory just isn't what it was a few young years back. So, here's what you can do. Pick a word, microphone. Capitalize the M. Okay, now, put a number behind it, one. And put a high-ended ASCII character, hashtag, or pound sign. We always called it pound signs, now it's hashtags. Can't figure that out. Um, but then what you're gonna do is you're gonna use an identifier. So for example, my cap one account, I'm gonna put the first two initials in front of that password. So I have CA, microphone cap, the number one, and a hashtag. That's my capital one password. My discover card password, DI, microphone one hashtag. My Yahoo password, YA, microphone one hashtag. Now, Les, that doesn't sound very secure. Well, you're using, what's not secure is using the same password at every single entity. And here's why. Years ago, iCloud got hacked and some not ready for prime time pictures of celebrities were being thrown out on the internet. Now, iCloud didn't get hacked, okay? What got hacked was that Yahoo account thing. Yahoo got hacked and people then looked and said, oh, here's their Yahoo email address or their login name and their Yahoo password, which because people use the same passwords and login for each and every entity, they're able to go on to Cap One, to American Express, to every single thing I have, and use that combination in there. That's why we're having this issue right now. Yes, it's inconvenient to continually use different email, um, do, use different passwords, but you've got to do it. Unfortunately, you've got to do it. When I drove in from New Orleans, I'm like, oh, man, I got two hours and five minutes in my car, and I'm bored, and blah, 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 but I had to do it. Sometimes you just got to do stuff that you don't want to do, and this is one of them. You've got to make sure that your passwords are unique. Now, there are password managers that you can use. I used Dashlane for quite a few years, and I really, really like it. Very cheap. Um, Keeper is an excellent one, too. But what I also do besides this is I have a Word document. Now, my Word document is inside my shared Dropbox account, which is a professional Dropbox account, not that free one you get. I pay money for my professional Dropbox account. Why? Well, number one, because I can use it for more things, but number two, it's much more secure than your free one. So I have a Dropbox account, and in my Dropbox account, I keep a Word document. My Word document is password protected because it has all my passwords in it. Now, my wife thinks that that's the most incredibly stupid thing in the world. Oh, well, what if somebody gets into that document? Okay, they've got to get into my, I've got to get into my, um, my um, Dropbox account, and then they've got to go ahead and know my password for my Word document to be able to get into that. Now, if you're really concerned about this, I said, okay, I'll make you feel better, Bev, no problem. Now, my wife's not a technologist, but she looks at things from a very strange standpoint. So, I took a piece of legal size pad, put it right next to my computer, and I wrote down all usernames and passwords of every single account we had, and I left it right there next to the computer. Oh my God, what are you, what are you doing? If somebody breaks into the house, they'll have, the, they can get all of our usernames and passwords. Well, first of all, if somebody's breaking into the house, they're going for the large screen TV. They ain't going for a piece of paper sitting there on the side, but if you're really worried about that, here's a trick. If you're gonna write it down in a Word document, you're gonna write it down anywhere, write it down, but put your passwords backwards. Write every single password backwards. 
And if somebody does get a hold of it, then they try to use those passwords, they can't get into it, and they're not going to know to go the other way. One of the partners at work had a real great one, because Outlook walk, works, walks around with you on your phone and on your um, laptop. He kept an Outlook, fake Outlook contact, and in the notes section is where he kept all of his passwords, usernames, passwords. And the secret here for the, the thing like me with the Dropbox account or the Outlook account is that you want to have access to your passwords no matter where you are. And so since both of those are on my phone, I can get into any username password I want no matter where I am. Let's talk real quickly. We're going to switch, switch subjects here. Working from home. So COVID taught us that we absolutely 100% could work from home. Could. Whether we want to or we want to have people doing that or not is, is a different subject. But working from home, let's just go through a few things. If you have people or you are working from home, what you should be doing to keep yourself protected, okay? Use strong passwords. We know that. Keep your software up to date on laptops and mobile devices. My wife will not update her iPhone. It drives me nuts. I say, do not, do not go into any of my accounts. Okay, the reason they update your iOS and your iPhone or update any 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 um any information that you have, like uh, websites and stuff like that. The reason they update these things is because they're going to go ahead and put out um, security, uh, fix security problems, fix bugs and stuff like that. But she went back to the iOS 7 when iOS 7 went to iOS 8, and it blew up. And ever since then, she doesn't want to do that. Like, no, dear, you have to do this. So you need to keep your software up to date, especially when you're working at home. Uh, make sure your laptop is backed up daily. Very important. Flash drive's too cheap right now. Stick a flash drive in it. Reboot your computer daily so antivirus software can be updated. I know people who are working from home right now that basically never turn their computer off. They never log off their computer. By the way, there is a difference between restart and shutdown. Okay? There is a difference there. A restart basically brings you all the way down, and that's what you should do. A shutdown will hold some information in memory, especially if you were using a quick startup. There's a quick startup function in Windows 10 and Windows 11. If you're using those, then you don't want to do a shutdown because it maintains those things. Restart your computer. Lock your computer when you take a break. I can't tell you the number of people's houses I walk into and their computer's up and they got something on the screen that's confidential. Okay, doesn't make any sense, just lock it. Windows key L if you're using a PC. Be extra vigilant of phishing email scams, don't access inappropriate websites, don't download files from other sources, don't leave sensitive work documents in common areas of your house. I've seen this going on a whole lot. We had to really caution our people and say, look, if you're gonna work on tax returns at home, then you need to make sure that when you are not working on it, like you go to lunch or whatever, take the tax return, the paperwork papers, and stick them in a drawer somewhere. Don't leave them out because you don't know who's going to knock on the door. You don't know who's going to be coming in your house, and it may be your best friend or your cousin or whatever, but you don't need them seeing your confidential information. Uh, be careful what others can see in your house when using video chat. I do a whole session, by the way, on, on what not to do in video chats. And um, I, I've just seen it all. Make sure you look at your background before. By the way, do me one favor. If you're doing a video chat and you're like this, make sure that the computer the camera is not shooting up your nose. Okay, too many people, if you, you can see the, if you can see the ceiling in your picture, it, you're not doing the right thing. Um, shred sensitive documents and reboot your cable modem daily. I'm back to now rebooting it weekly. But reboot your cable modem. People never do that. Unplug it. Leave it off for 10 seconds, plug it back in. You will get better throughput. If you do a speed test on your computer you'll add, and your internet process, you'll get better throughput by going ahead and just unplugging your modem for uh, 10 seconds and once a week and going ahead and putting it back on. All right, before we get into the internet of things, I, thank you. Before we get into the internet of things, I want to share with you the story I had told you about before. A few years back, right before COVID, uh, my tax partner and I, went out to a um, retirement community home in New Orleans. And we were called out there to do a talk on cybersecurity and what they should do and what they shouldn't do. And if you want to get me going, do something bad to kids or old people. That, should, it, I, I, that just makes me want to cringe. And the reason they had us come out was because their, their residents at this, at this home were getting emails and phone calls and text messages telling them to send money to a certain place. 
And what happened was UPS, when they scanned two boxes coming out of this home, they scanned and one had $10,000 in it and the other one had $25,000 in cash in it. Somebody had tricked them. And they were able to get their money back, but they were able to get their money back because UPS scanned. If not, they'd be out the money. Don't take advantage of old people and elderly. So I get a phone call a few weeks after I had retired from one of my partners, and she says, can you talk to one of my clients? Uh, they think they got hacked. Now, we're gonna count the number of things they did incorrectly, okay? So, he got a text message, and the text message said, your McAfee subscription has auto-renewed for $500. Wow, that's kind of expensive. If this is a mistake, call this phone number. Okay, what should he have done if he thinks that he had gotten a, a thing of charge for $500 on his, on his bank card or his bank account? Go out to the bank and make sure before you talk to anybody that that's real, that you have lost that money. Didn't do it. Calls the phone number. Guy goes, oh, sir, we're real sorry. Made a mistake. We need to send you the money back, but we can't send you $500 back. We're going to have to send you two $250 amounts back. Okay? Hold on one second. Wait, wait, wait. A few minutes later, guy comes back on board. He goes, oh, my goodness, sir. I just made a mistake. Instead of sending you $250 back, I put a couple of extra zeros. I didn't put the decimal place in. I just sent you $25,000 back to your account. Can you send me back the $24,750. Guy didn't go to his bank account at that point in time to check and see if it was there. But what the really good scammer did was this. He said, you know what we'll do, sir? I want to go ahead and make sure that this gets into your account. So can you go ahead and let me log into your computer, and I will go, we'll go ahead and look at your account. So he logs into the computer, pulls up his bank statement, and immediately notices there's no $25,000 credit on there. And then his screen goes black. And 30 seconds later, his screen comes back, and remarkably, there's a $25,000 credit on his account. What they did was they took a screenshot of his account and went ahead and did some Photoshopping in there and made it look like, and returned to him, the Photoshop. So. He goes, okay, um, how can I do that? And they said, well, who's your bank? Chase. Okay, I'm going to go to Chase. Well, you go to Chase and tell them you want to wire the $25,000 to a Bitcoin account. Still hadn't hit him that this is, this is all a fake. The man then goes ahead and calls Chase, tells Chase to wire transfer. And the final piece... They call him back. They say, sir, uh, we, have a, we have a problem. We can't remove $25,000 out of our Bitcoin account. It can only be, you can only remove a minimum of $100,000. Could you please send $75,000 more, which at that point in time, he didn't do. He called, he called Chase. Chase said, he called their fraud department. Chase said, did you authorize the charge? He goes, yes. He goes, it's not fraud. You were fooled, but there was nothing fraudulent that happened. You committed technological suicide. You basically took to your account and, and, and did that. Anyway, he's out $25,000. Um, that's the type of things we need to look at from the perspective of you being tricked. The bad guys are going to do everything they can to trick you, and that's why the second set of eyes is so important. That's why I've started to look at this more from the training, training, training side rather than there's nothing we can do that will stop that from happening unless we train that person not to do that. And that's what I'm counting on you guys doing and all the people online is taking this information and going back. So let's real quickly talk about the Internet of Things. Internet of Things is one of my favorite things. It's all those things that talk to the Internet. And in your house, your cars, your thermostats, blah, blah, blah. Amazon Echo, love those. Yeah, I'm going to let somebody listen to what I'm doing. Oh, Les, they're not really listening. <laughs> okay. Yeah, did you read a few months ago where the Amazon were actually listening to the thing to make sure the heuristics were working? 
<laughs> okay, that's not going to go in my house. Um, if you use a Wi-Fi at home and you just go buy a Wi-Fi off the shelf, you have to secure that Wi-Fi. Okay, you've got to change the administration. This is to administer the Wi-Fi. You got to change your administration modules, password and username. Because right now, if you go buy a Netgear, the username to get into the Netgear account is admin and the password is password. Therefore, I can drive down my street and if I see something broadcasting itself as Netgear, I know how to get on their account. So you need to be changing that name. That is done inside the administration module. And then you rename. Don't leave it named as Netgear. Okay, I rename my router every few months. My current name is FBI Surveillance Van Number Four. <laughs> I guarantee you, no one's going to go after that. Okay, and you obviously need to change the access password. I have about three minutes left. If there are any questions, comments, thoughts, yes, yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay, the, the, the question is about uh, the restart versus shutdown. The, in Windows, you can tell Windows you want it to go ahead and do a quick come up. When you turn it on, I want you to come up quickly. So with the Windows doing that, having that capability, in order for it to come up real quickly, if you do a shutdown, it remembers, it puts into memory some of the stuff that was in there already. So if you want to clear out everything, you do a restart. That makes sense? Great. Yes, sir. I'm sorry? It'll generate these websites that'll generate uh, automatic passwords for Okay, uh, and a question on that was? How are they worthy or are they secure? Okay, or? websites that generate passwords. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, you, any password you choose. The question was uh, websites that generate passwords for you, are they secure? Yeah, any password you can get that you can you can have that has a, a minimum of eight characters, has uh, uppercase, lowercase, a number, and some sort of high-ended character in there, then, then you'd be great. And those password generators create things that just you never even heard of. Yes? It's a two-point question. Um, if you have LifeLock or something similar, do you still have to freeze your credit? And if you do have to freeze your credit, should you freeze with all three or can you just do one of the three? Great question. My understanding of, now I'm not a LifeLock user, but I know that LifeLock's been given out by some people that have been breached. Um, my understanding is LifeLock is, pro, is reactive, not proactive. Therefore, yes, I would think that you'd have to uh, go ahead and do it. Uh, go ahead and freeze your account. However, I can't be 100% secure, um, totally secure about that only because I don't know about LifeLock. The second part was... Should or do you, you have to do all three? Why not? I, I know some people who just did one. You know, that, okay, but what happens if they go to the credit, you go to a bank and the guy, bad guy goes to a bank, he gives your information, and they don't go to one, they go to TransUnion. You know, they, they, you have to do all three. Yes, absolutely. Anything else? All right. Another question? All right, in closing, again, I, I know I harped on the training part of it. Uh, that's because now I'm looking at this whole thing from a different perspective. I'm not in the environment anymore from day to day. I'm looking at it from the end user, and I'm looking at the number of calls that I'm getting on all this stuff. Guys, be safe out there. I love that term, always from Hill Street Blues. Be safe out there. You know, you, 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 this has to be in the front of your mind every time you use a computer. And if you're a boss, please, please bring this to your people and demand that they start to use their minds and use the, the, the information you've given them because unless the bosses really get on board here, the staff's not going to get on board. It's going to have to come from the bosses. With that, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate being here and have a great rest of the conference.